Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. I'm Lauren Maupin. I'm the Manager of Education and Programs at the Kluge Roo Aboriginal Art Collection of the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Before we go any further, I want to take the time to acknowledge that the Kluge Roo Aboriginal Art Collection and our partner, the Fraley Museum of Art, are both uh, located on the land of the Monica Nation, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And since we're all joining from locations around the world, I want to acknowledge the indigenous, the indigenous nations where each of us are located. Um, and I encourage you, if you don't know who those people are, that you find out and that you learn about them and their art and their culture. I also want to take this time to acknowledge a Kluge Roo volunteer who has been absolutely instrumental in making this program happen. And that is our very beloved Joan Kindig. Um, Joan has been volunteering at Kluge Roo for, I believe, six or seven years now um, and is a notable individual in the world of children's books. She was the one who connected us with both Christy and Henry, and I know she's thrilled that they're participating and getting connected with Dub as well. So we're so grateful for your help, Joan, and uh, for your ongoing loyalty and support of Kluge Roo. Um, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Lisa, who's going to introduce our program today. Thank you, Lauren. Um, my name is Lisa Jevak, and I am the assistant, the assistant to the director and special projects coordinator at the Fralin Museum of Art. And I want to welcome you to the fifth webinar in a series where the Fralin Museum of Art and the Kluge Roo Aboriginal Art Collection, which are both museums at the University of Virginia, are investigating art forms that don't typically show up in the museum. We felt that there are all kinds of art forms that are culturally dense, deeply tied to identity and formally and technically complex that deserve our attention. Often these are taken for granted because they are part of our daily lives and aren't set aside or labeled as deserving our full attention. So each speaker is going to speak for about five to 10 minutes about their own relationship with the world of children's books. Then we have a few questions that apply to all the speakers, which will help guide a discussion. And then we'll open it up for a live Q&A. And that is where all of you can use the Q&A feature uh, to type in a question. And we will go through those. We will do our best to get to as many of your questions as, as we can, um, as time allows. So without further ado, we want to get started and uh, give our, our speakers, our panelists, uh, an opportunity to tell you about themselves. And our first, uh, first guest is Henry Cole. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, everybody. I'm speaking to you from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where we're having a giant thunderstorm, which is kind of exciting. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about why I'm passionate about what I do. And I thought about that for a long time um, this week. This week I was out in Kansas speaking to schools. I spend a lot of my time talking to elementary schools about being an author, being an illustrator. It's one of my favorite things to do. I have a background uh, I, I, in, in teaching. I was an elementary school science and math teacher for about 18 years. So I love speaking to kids. So here I was for the first time after the whole COVID thing, I was out in rural, rural Kansas speaking to kids and I had a wonderful time out there, but I was on the plane coming back last night and I was thinking, okay, what am I, what am I passionate about? Why am I passionate about anything? And then wouldn't you know it to answer my, I get, I get this email. It was like, oh, this thing was sent to me. This, came right out of the blue today. Hi, Mr. Cole. You probably don't remember me, but back in 2006 or 2007, I was like, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember 2000 this morning. You know, she says, you came to my elementary school. Okay, so what is that? What, like 12, I don't know, how many years ago? Um, you signed my book and I, told you that I wanted to be an illustrator one day too. Well, now I'm 23 and I recently signed to a children's book agent. 
Thank you so much for inspiring me <laughs> to be a young, at such a young age. I was like, yeah, I guess that's what makes me passionate is I'll speak to kids about drawing and writing books, which I love to do. And I think when I'm in front of a group of 200 kids and I'm jumping around and sweating through my shirt and getting excited about that, um, I think it kind of, it may be some of that rolls off onto kids who were thinking of maybe doing the same thing someday. I hope so. Um, I am fortunate enough to have grown up on a farm in Virginia where I was closely in tune with the outdoors. Um, I loved exploring the woods and scooping up things in a jar in the creek or the pond. And that forms so much of my interest in I hate to say interest in nature, but interest in things that grow outside and live outside and outside of my world. And I think that's my biggest fear of kids today is that they are so detached from the outside world. A lot of them, they live in very sterile environments that don't allow them to explore and dig and, and create outside. And I'm sorry about that. I am also fortunate to have had siblings. Uh, I'm the youngest of five and I had four older siblings who were very interesting people and we did things outside a lot and I followed them in their adventures that they did. And my mom was also a huge part of this too because she had been an illustrator, uh, a fashion illustrator in New York and Washington DC um, pre-World War II and during the war and uh, her ability to draw and um, illustrate, especially portraits, I think had a huge influence on me and um, directed me in this in this career. I was an elf, like I said, I was an elementary school science teacher for a long time and mm -hmm. went into children's books after that. And that was about, uh, well, my memory fades, but I think that was about 24 years ago. Um, and I've been illustrating and writing books ever since. I love what I do. And I hope that shows when I speak to kids groups around the country. Lisa, I'm gonna throw it back to you now. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And I love the story about the email. That was perfect timing and well, very- I mean, that never happens, right? Very sweet, yes. So sweet. <laughs> All right. Um, well, now I'm going to pass it over to Deb Leffler, who is going to tell us tell us who he is. Uh, hi from Australia. Um, hi guys. Um, my name is Deb Leffler. I'm a Capricorn. I like long walks on the beach. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm. I'm an author and illustrator. I'm an occasional author, um, primarily an illustrator, and I've been. Uh, illustrating for about 20 years. Um, so I started when I was 10. <laughs> um, I'm, well, I'm actually 45. Uh, and I, I, I specialize in Aboriginal literature, um, uh, being Aboriginal myself. There's um, not many Aboriginal illustrators in the world. Uh, I can count on both hands, so there's probably about 10 in the country, maybe. Um, and uh, um, we all know each other. Uh, and I, so my work you can see in the, uh, the background here is, is um, it's a bit of a contrast with Henry's, which I, I love, by the way. Um, uh, high detail and uh, I've, uh, you know, it's about, I think it's about 25 books that I have illustrated. And um, so by uh, in about two years, it'll be 30 books. So, um, and I'm enjoying the journey. And that's what, um, that's, that's what I like to share with kids. And I think, you know, probably one of the most important things about illustration is that it is an extremely old way of communicating and it um, predates written language. Uh, written language coming from um, pictograms and um, 
and illustrations. So I, you know, I, I like to um, let kids know that, that um, you know, it's, it's a quite an honourable profession in that sense. So um, that's, yeah, I hope that um, gives you a bit of an overview. Thank you, Dub. Yes. Um, and thank you so much for joining us all the way from Australia. Um, all right. I might just jump in just to say that Dub's work, if you're joining us locally, Dub's work is on view right now at Clueviru. So you can come see some of the illustrations that you just saw in the flesh at Clueviru. And there's also a virtual exhibition that you can explore if you're not local. So just put in a plug for that. Yes. Deb is, is the Kluge Roos artist in residence right now. Oh, that's right. I, yeah, I forgot about that little exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> happening, you know, across the world. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to hand it over to Christy Ottaviano. So um, my presentation is a little different. Um, first, I just want to say it's, it's such a pleasure to be on this panel with two hugely talented illustrators. Um, I love working with artists. It's uh, probably my favorite part of the job of being an editor. And, and what I thought I would do is just sort of quickly take you through um, what I do and sort of sort of point out the different areas um, that I publish into and show you the different type of illustration that um, I'm seeking out given uh, the different projects. So I um, worked for 28 years. I started there and um, I just left in um, November of last year and moved my imprint over to Little Brown and Company. And I brought with me two of my staff members from Macmillan. And it has been uh, a wonderful experience uh, to work with the team at Little Brown. Um, I'm a generalist, so I publish picture books through uh, young adult fiction as well as nonfiction. And um, I thought I would, like I said, just go through and tell you a little bit about um, the different genres I publish into. So um, I, in having my own imprint, what that means essentially is that um, it's more of a boutique imprint. I'm uh, attracted to topics that I'm personally interested in as well as books that obviously can work in the marketplace. Um, my background is in education, so I know the curriculum, um, the national curriculum um, very well, and I'm always looking for opportunities to publish into this space, um, looking for books in the preschool market that explore childhood milestones, counting books, first experiences, and as you can see, the illustration, you know, these covers, very bold and graphic and colorful um, for the young readership. Um, I'm also all about building programs for my authors. I've worked with many of the same authors for over 20 years. And so if something's working, uh, you know, these were all books that were started as a one-off and then they were succeeding in the marketplace. So then building a program uh, to support um, uh, the publishing. Um, the Hello World series, uh, that's actually called the Happy County series. I love working on that series with Ethan Long. It's sort of a modern day Richard Scarry. Uh, presentation uh, exploring early childhood concepts. Um, again, my my backlist is all over. You know, exploring curriculum connections, whether it's STEM content, um, books about the seasons, um, books about um, inclusivity, um, geography. Uh, my passion area within the picture book uh, sector is really biography. I do a lot in this area and really built the program at Millen for picture book biography. And as you can see, very different illustration across the different uh, jackets. Um, the subject matter uh, always inspired me to seek out a particular artist um, uh, for you know a, a different subject matter. The book on George Ferris. Uh, um, George Ferris invented the Ferris wheel as we know it. Um, I was looking for someone who could do period really well. And um, he did an amazing job. He was a terrific researcher. And then um, the book right near it, Pasco and Collect 200, that was a book on the gay monopoly. I, I was eager to use him because he did, again, so much thoughtful research and he was just amazing with his period detail. 
Um, I have a real fondness for art and music history and bringing that to children. I feel it's just such an important, uh, it, it's important for us to introduce young children to um, uh, the arts. And so I really love looking to explore biography in different ways. Uh, when I was growing up, a lot of biography uh, was very chronological in approach. Um, I think now we are trying lots of different things. The book on Ansel Adams really just explores a slice in his life as a child. By today's standards, he would probably be diagnosed with Asperger's or on the spectrum. And at the time, his father knew he couldn't learn conventionally like other children. He gave him a camera and let him go explore nature. And we, Ansel Adams, you know, emerged from that. Um, so I love sort of trying to find ways to tell these stories and hire illustrators who can really capture the essence of the book. Um, that book was all done in collage art. Um, I just finished up the book on Leo Fender before I left Macmillan. And um, this is a book. Uh, about Leo Fender who invented um, the electric guitar and really ushered in rock and roll as we know it. And I just have to point out this wonderful fact that I, I think kids will love. He didn't know how to play any instrument. He did not play the guitar yet he invented like one of the most important inventions of the last century. Um, as you can see in some illustration here, you know, the artist um, was paying homage to, you know, in the case of Wendell Minor with Edward Hopper, um, Gabby Siakoska, really, I wanted someone who could sort of um, bring Mary Cassatt's work to life. Um, so again, lots of decision making going into, you know, trying to choose the right artist for a particular project. Um, women's history is my complete passion area and, and finding um, a lot of hidden, hidden figure stories that we can bring to, to children. Um, Counting on Catherine is about Catherine Johnson, who saved Apollo 13, Marie Tharp in the right corner. Uh, she um, mapped the ocean floor and never got credit for it. And she had a lot to do with, um, you know, the way we look at plate tectonics today. And her, uh, a man took credit for her work up until about 15 years ago when uh, her story became known. So I'm really interested in, in, in exploring, again, a lot of these hidden figures. In the case of An Equal Shot, this was such an interesting book because it was a, a topic I pitched to an author. It's about Title IX, the legislation for Title IX. And the challenge was, how do you illustrate a book about a law? And um, I loved working with Dow Fumurek, and I really felt like she thought conceptually, and she did an amazing job bringing that, um, that book to life. Nature and science, also areas that I love to publish into. Um, I wanted to just point out Handimals because I can't believe I got this through the acquisition board at Macmillan. It's such an out of the box, unusual book. It's a book about really body art, hand art, and animals. Um, the book is focuses on endangered species all through this beautiful art, body art um, by this Italian artist, body artist. So that was really interesting to work on. And it's it's working as a, as a gift book right now. And I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, picture book, uh, character and humor. Um, you know, I think whenever we ask people what their favorite books are, so many people call to mind, you know, books with characters in them, Madeline, Olivia. Um, and, you know, I think character plays such a strong role in children's books. And as publishers, we're always looking for wonderful characters um, that we hope can live on in more than just one book. Um, and a lot of these illustrators, um, for instance, uh, The Very Inappropriate Word, and It's Not Easy Being Number Three, these are, are professional cartoonists who have also turned their eye to children's book illustration. Um, and uh, Tough Cookie, Eddie Hemingway in the corner also has an animation background. And I think that all those sort of like background details add so much to um, their work. Um, I just wanted to sort of talk about the fact that, you know, I get submissions and I love working. I love working traditionally that way. I also love getting to know my authors and knowing what their interest areas are so that I can sort of help them uh, come up with new ideas for stories. I do work with a lot of art, author artists, so always looking for their next project. But I also like to pick, pitch ideas. And uh, there's something that I think uh, and I mentioned, I already mentioned the Monopoly book. I was, I was following a story in the New York Times about the landlord's game 
which was really the, the um, an early version of Monopoly. Um, Charles Darrow, who actually got the credit for inventing Monopoly, had bought the patent out um, from Elizabeth Magi and uh, for $500, he bought it for $500. And he tweaked the game a little bit and you know he became a millionaire. So this story is really a women's history story and um, set, the, set, it, set the record straight. Um, I was also recently following the story about Kavan, the elephant who was alone in a zoo in Pakistan and um, not doing well. And a, um, a veterinarian got word of this and tried to help him and then Cher got involved and the story went viral and he got moved to Cambodia and it's a happy ending. He's around other elephants. And I was so inspired by this story um, that I pitched it to an author I had been working with who I knew loved animals. And I also put an illustrator on it who I knew adored animals and actually contributes uh, to an elephant charity. I didn't know that at the time, but so that has sort of a really sweet ending. And lastly, I just wanted to say like inspiration comes, you know, from, I think illustrators know they're pulling from within their personal experiences. It is also true as an editor and a publisher. Those are my boys when they were little. They were obsessed with Legos uh, to the point where I just probably spent thousands and thousands of dollars on Legos. And I wanted to figure out a way how to do books um, uh, about Legos. And so I found a Lego artist, Sean Kenny, and we created these books together. Um, they were not licenses with Lego. We just, uh, you know, he, I helped him to write them and we uh, photographed them and um, we had a nice run with them. We did 10 together. Um, and just in wrapping up, um, another character that has moved on into different formats for us is Arnie the Donut. I've worked with Lori Keller since the beginning. I published her very first book, The Scrambled States of America. And around 15, 20 years ago, we published Arnie the Donut. And that was just, you know, a book that was sort of a... Um, you know, it just had such a long tail. It was, uh, it just worked for so long. And um, so I encouraged her to write a chapter book series about him. And we did that. And this last fall, we brought out a preschool book on Arnie, again, with the idea of sort of like stepping stones. Uh, kids can start with Hello Arnie, move into Arnie, then move into the chapter books. And it's moved into proper to property territory. There's a plush toy, there's a musical, um, <laughs> Uh, he was recently a clue in the New York Times crossword puzzle. So that's like a huge, wonderful experience to have something like this happen so organically. Um, it's great for the author, obviously, and it's great for the house. Um, so I'm very proud of how that has worked out. And just to finish, I also, my sweet spots are picture books and novels and middle grade novels in particular. And I commission all of my own art. So I'm always looking for interesting jacket artists. And often I try artists out on a jacket cover. For instance, the three books in the Winter House series in the middle row left, um, I'm eagerly looking for a picture book text for uh, Chloe Bristol. She did such a wonderful job illustrating those books on the interiors and the jackets are beautiful. So um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this presentation just to give you a little bit of an overview of my role in the process working with artists. And um, again, it's like the high, been the highlight of my career, uh, that part of the job. So um, I find artists so inspirational and I love how different they all are. And I also love that they all work differently. You know, someone asked me recently, you know, to describe how it is to work with an artist. Every artist works differently. And I'm really flexible about that. I don't have any, you know, um, hard and fast rule for how I work with any particular person. I sort of like to treat it very organically. And I think that brings out the best work in um, the artist. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. That was a great overview and I'm sure it will um, drum up a lot of questions about the role of a publisher too as we um, continue into the discussion part of this program. I also just love so far, um, based on all, what all three of you have said, there are so many common commonalities with um, how artists work, I mean, you know, that show up in the museum, just this idea of research and aesthetics and the impact that you want to have and um, drawing on personal experience and highlighting 
elements of our world in you know really creative and very innovative ways. Um, my first question to all of you is really about the power of illustration to communicate, um, to communicate things that are not in the text necessarily at all. Um, and sort of that extra learning that happens just through the illustration itself. Um, but also, um, you know, there are many circumstances in which, uh, you know, the, the children who are one of the primary audiences are, are not able to read yet. And so what they're, they are obviously being read the story, but they're, they're, you know, really being immersed in that, in that visual world. So can you each maybe talk about um, that ability for illustration to communicate something maybe um, beyond the text itself and how that informs what you do. Well, I'll start. I've done um, several wordless books um, because sometimes I think, you know, when a book is written and illustrated, it's all done. So you get to read it. But other times I think, well, what if there are no words? And so part of your job is to come up with the words for the story. And I love that idea that a kid is turning the pages and there's some sort of dialogue going on and um, in, you know, imagining what's being said and done in the pages. The tough part is that you have to create a, a sequence of events without the words. So this, the pictures from page to page have to have to flow and tell the story. Um, and the other part of that that I really love um, is you're looking at a picture and a story and you're inferring things that are going on or you're inferring by the expression on their faces, what's going on, the characters' faces, what's going on. Inference is a big deal. And, and we all do it every day. So it's really fun for a kid, you know, an eight year old to the inferring things from the pictures that you've created. I, I, I get a big charge out of that. I love that idea. No words, but a story is still there. It, it, it's in, um, it's sort of like they, you're the reader. I mean, it'd be interesting to hear what you guys think of that the, you know, we finish a book or we finish it to a certain point and then the reader actually they complete the story in a sense. Do you guys get that? Do you get that notion that they because so they will either you know keep creating the world that you've shown them a little bit, and then and they'll often you know see things in it that um, you haven't you you didn't realise. Mm -hmm. Do you guys get that? You know that, that they will um, because yeah they'll start making their own. Um, you know, they'll, they'll see a doorway in the story and then they just go through it and then they'll create their own world and it continues. Um, is that what you guys think? You, you... I agree, totally, yeah. Is, I mean, it's, can I, I, I just want to show um, a... Uh, oh, goody, a visual. I do, I've got... Um, I just want to show you this one. Uh, this illustration I did, um, and the setup is these men are looking for these for these um, kids, and they're hiding here. And um, you know, we can see that it's in the text is there, but what isn't written? Um, but I've sort of you know, and this is what we do. I think you know, we we aim to extend the story without. Um, um, you know, changing the text, but that we sort of can illustrate, you know, running alongside the story. So that, you know, this, I've set up this thing where the children are hiding, um, but when they're um, in the process of doing that, they've scared this, this is bird up here. And this guy has seen it, you see, he's seen it. So there's this, um, that unwritten part you know, of extending the story. Uh, I um I think you know we we aim to do that. Well, to your point, to your point, Deb. I mean, from from an editor's point of view, 
you know, I think a lot of editors would agree with me that I may, let's say a text is written by an author and illustrated, uh, you know, separately. Um, let's say I've gone through three or four rounds of editing with the author on that text. Once that book gets into like, layouts and the sketches are brought in, um, so much more editing of the text is done because an artist will bring, uh, you know, um, a new interpretation uh, to that page. And I will no longer, I, it'll feel redundant to have something called out um, that is so obviously illustrated beautifully. And it would be, um, uh, again, just sort of like superfluous to have it um, in addition to the illustration. So I feel like we're always editing very much until that very last round of layouts um, to make sure that the text and the art are really in sync to, to your point. That's it's that's interesting that I so I I, I um yeah maybe that's something I haven't thought about when it comes to um you know handing in storyboards and stuff like that I, I actually um maybe it's a uh, uh you know maybe it's a US thing or um because every publisher works differently don't they and it's um you know it's the same as like every illustrator works differently we have a different process and it's and um, you know, it's trying to match those up, which um, is, you know, that's always fun. That that's actually a wonderful segue into my next question, um, which is about the publisher and the editor's role in children's books and sort of the process that a book goes through and the role of illustration in that process. Um, so my question is a little bit different for the artist versus you, Christy. I mean, it would, I would love to hear, like, are there times when, for you artists, uh, that the publisher really directs what direction you go, to what extent, you know, are you, are you reined in ever? Um, and for you, Christy, like, from not, not the opposite perspective, everybody's working together here, I think, but like, what, what kind, what do you aim for your role to be in that process? Uh, um, are we all jumping in here? Uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm working on a book. I'm just finishing up a book where I submitted a, a story line. And now that I look back on it, it was a very thin <laughs> story line. But it had, a good, it had a good base to it. And the editor, God bless her, wonderful gal, I love her to bits. She took it and she said, give it up, let's go. And she added to this. What if, the, what if we do this? What if we do, you know, I, I, I love this. And I talk to kids when I speak in schools, how important collaboration is. So here's me and the editor and the designer. There are three brains working on this now, not just, one half of a brain, but three brains working. And so with three brains, all kinds of ideas come out. And in my opinion, it just blossoms into something better. And I know I've, I've talked to other authors who go, oh my gosh, this is my idea and this is the way I want it. it often I just don't see it that way. I see it as, as a collaborative event and wonderful things happen when we talk through it and make it even better than it is. I am so blessed in that regard. Especially I, I, think, I think, I mean, do, do you find, you know, we, uh, as, as illustrators, you know, I was talking to um, some other illustrators at the Sydney Writers Festival a couple of days ago, that, um, you know, we often treated uh, as second class citizens, um, oh, yes. and because, you know, do, you know, and because of that, because of that, um, we we inherently know how everyone else works you know like we know that we are part of a team um but there's there's a, that whole balancing act isn't it there's like you know the, we can develop a little bit of an ego if we have some good work out there but we still know that you know um that we, that the editor is important the graphic designer is important um you know we all highlight each other's work and that's what we want to do you know that, 
oh, that was good. That's a good storm. <laughs> um, um, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's like coming in. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like literary racism, you know, we, we you know, we get, um, it, you know, we get put down the bottom, especially in acceptance speeches, you know, I, and I'll, I'll be get, I, do you find that you get owned, you know, it'd be interesting to know, it, you know, they say, oh, my illustrator, um, I had, a, I had a, an author do that to me the other day, um, uh, I'd like to thank my designer, my, you know, my, it's, it's, and, but we're all sort of part, you know, it's, um, I don't know, it's, it is what it is. It's always, I, what, I, what do you think? I, I, mean, I think you, that, you know, I will be referred to as someone's illustrator, but I never refer to somebody else as my author. That's right. We don't go, yeah. The author of this book. It's not my author, but I've been referred to as, well, my illustrator. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We are lowly. What, what do you think, Christy, of that, your experience? Well, my experience is a little bit different in that um, my setup, I do a lot of art direction. I mean, I work with, I work with the design team, but I do a lot of that art direction on my own prior to bringing it to the to the designers, um, just again, it's just the way I've been working with my imprint for a number of years. I have a background in art. I'm not very good. I'm an amateur, but I took a lot of classes in art education. And so I feel like I have a really strong appreciation for how artists work. And I understand the very different processes that are involved. So, you know, I would say, you know, I, I really appreciate what you said, Henry, about the collaborative process, because I just feel that you know the best books are made through the collaborative process, um, and but I love pushing my artists in the sense that I might say, why don't you try the like that book on Edward Hopper? Wendell Miner does these beautiful sort of like charcoal sketches, and he does so many full color picture books. He never gets to use them in in um, a picture book format, so. I encouraged him to have charcoal like vignettes um, woven through that book. And I'm always eager to try to push um, artists into different areas in terms of, you know, especially if I've worked with them before and I, I know, uh, you know, I, I feel comfortable sort of encouraging them to maybe try a different style or take on a project that's totally different. Um, so I, uh, but I completely understand that, um, you know, there are certain experiences that artists have where they do feel like they're, um, they're put in a box or, you know, I mean, one of the things that I think, you know, younger editors, I'm always sort of telling my team is, you know, you can't, bring an illustrator on for a project without explaining, you know, if they work in several different styles, you need to indicate which one that you think would be right for this book. And obviously hear what they have to say, but you know, um, you have to be transparent going into that because you don't want to change up. You know, I think many editors have been in that situation where, you know, you do the deal in 2017 and then 2019, the first sketches come in and it's very different than what, uh, you know, you thought you had commissioned. Um, and maybe the artist just had changed their mind in terms of the type of illustration they were gonna do, or maybe you talked about, I don't know, full spreads, bleeds and there, you know, I think it's really important to be as clear as possible. But at the same time, I also understand how once you start working on a project, you know, you get a different feel for it and things change. So, um, you know, I try to be really, you know, open with that. Um, and, but again, I certainly understand the frustrations that can come from too many cooks in a kitchen. And I personally avoid that on my end by keeping it pretty tight, so. I think there's just, just the right number of cooks in the kitchen can make it work very nice. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you know as long as we know that we, it's it's this you know we are cooking the same dish. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, it's interesting. It's it is a balancing act, isn't it? It's like um, I mean, some you know, because some ways it can sort of feel like a cog in the machine. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, and that that's the tricky thing. You can you know to be part of a team and yet be valued. Um, as um, you know, I get lots of um, I get lots of comments on the work that I've done because uh, in in the way that it can be very different from one book to another. Sure. Um, there'll be a very broad, colorful style and it'll be a very detailed pen and ink kind of style. And I'll get uh, asked to a book and they'll say, we can't wait to do this book. And I'm thinking, well, what are you thinking of? How do you want this book? Because there are different looks to it. Yes. Um, I'll get like a, like a technical gardeny, nature-y kind of thing and then another kind of style and people and so, you know it's, it's sort of actually kind of civil like i feel like i've got like split personalities or something but but you can't um you can't get you can't illustrate two very different books the same way i i use this example with a kid this week in uh, in kansas um i said well you wouldn't illustrate a little book about a bunny rabbit, you know, the same way as you would a book about Frankenstein. You know, it's just, they're just, it would just have to look very different. Um, and I'm very, I'm, I'm, I, I get excited when I think about illustrating something differently than I just did, you know, the last book. I, I like switching it around. I mean, because the, the aim is to improve, isn't it? You know, you want to improve on your art. Yeah. Uh, and, and also that, that would help your longevity as an illustrator. You know, I think I just said, yeah, like <laughs> I'm picking up Australian accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I, w, oh, civil. oh my God. Dub, you've talked in other places about sort of changes that have been made to your illustrations based on audience needs, like, and, and you know, a number of your books um, address rather deep traumatic histories of Australia. Um, and I, I mean that the example, the example that I've heard you tell elsewhere about that one image where it was too violent at first or the publisher thought it was too violent yeah. and then put, you know, that kind of pushing you to think about it differently. I think you've said in the past that that really made it better in the end, um, or it made it more subtle or something. And that really speaks to what Chrissy was saying too, about just, and Henry as well, about how collaboration and, and pushing can, can bring the book, you know, to a, the next level, um, which is, is really interesting and beautiful. I'm interested to hear from you all and audience members, feel free to uh, chime in with a question in the Q&A um, yeah. as well. But um, I'm interested to hear um, a bit about sort of um, why, why do you think that, that illustration as an art form um, isn't featured so much in museums and art galleries, um, especially when so many illustrators have fine art backgrounds um, and when there is so much research and personal experience and intention and collaboration that goes into the works. Um, and then often, you know, one of the beautiful things about Dub's exhibition right, right now at Kluge Roo is that like, we get to see all of his sort of like playing with color to figure out what's gonna work best. That all obviously gets cut out um, when the book is published, but there's this whole process there that is sort of um, hidden in the actual, in the final product. So I'm just wondering like, why do you think it's not thought about that way? Why do you think, um, you know, certain, you know, these works are not collected as, are often not collected as fine art. Well, I, I, I think, you know, it's, um, unfortunately, it's, um, children's books are, are seen in a sense as children's toys. Um, and, you know, something, it, it's all gifts, you know, and um, with, um, you know, I'm, I'm generalizing and just, you know, so it's, uh, it's just seen as something that, you know, can be a gift, can, can bring, you know, um, uh, you know, a few moments of joy. A bit like, yeah. you know, and, um, 
I, you know, I guess like, I mean, we were talking the, the, um, the other day, Christy, about it, um, at the same um, where um, everybody, um, you know, they don't take it seriously and they think, you know, everyone's, I've got a great story. Um, oh, I, I'd love, you know, it, it's always that sort of, they just see it as something that's very easy and um, that anybody can do and then it actually isn't an art form it's not, there isn't any craft to it and um, i think i think you're right that it's in everybody's mind that anybody can make a children's book that's part of it and also that uh there's a history of illustrators being several layers down from fine artists like norman rockwell was less thought of than well, somebody i don't know Edward hopper i don't know but uh I think it's a. I think it's historic, the way that illustrators have been treated that way. And I guess, yeah, and I, and I guess it's probably um, sort of goes to the broader picture that um, because you know, like the, on the most part, it's children that are absorbing our work, and so the you know, uh, adults at large are just sort of well, that's just kids. It's kids play, really, and so they're not sort of valuing not only what the you know what the kids are reading and what they're absorbing, but the kids themselves. I think there's, there might be um, now I might be overreaching there, but it's um yeah yeah, why, yeah. maybe almost this idea that like once something becomes or like um, falls into a kid's realm, it, it's sort of taken out of that like fine art world which is really unfortunate too but Christy did you have any thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah what I was just gonna say it's a little bit like the snobbery that exists in art schools where it's like are you a fine arts major are you an illustration major you know I think that there is so much more sort of importance attached to fine arts majors and the irony is that the illustration majors are the ones who are actually going to make a living in most cases and and they're trained in many ways just like fine artists um, so there is that sort of fallacy there but i do have to say that i think that the the world is changing a bit about um, children's book children's books in general but certainly children's book illustration especially over the last 10 years i think you know um, I, I do feel that I live in on the East Coast and there's a lot of smaller museums that feature art by children's book creators. And um, I saw a show recently on James um, uh, Stevenson uh, during COVID actually. Uh, so I do think that um, th that is shifting, that, that thinking. I think that is a result of the fact that the world is so visual now and that young people today, it's why graphic novels are so popular. You know, young people today are just learning, uh, you know, through visual media, everything is very visual for them. I mean, when I first got into publishing, we were sort of instructed as editors, you know, after chapter books, like middle grade fiction, like don't have a lot of art in the books because kids don't wanna, you know, they don't wanna feel uh, like they're reading, uh, you know, books that are, um, you know, for little kids. And now we can't have enough art in the books. I mean, it's taken on a whole new form. And so uh, I think that's hugely encouraging. And I do think that um, uh, more attention is being paid to the craft of illustration in children's books. And I, I think that the, um, uh, you know, the thinking behind children's books will continue to elevate. Um, but it is true. I mean, my entire adult life, people have said to me, you know, oh, you're a children's book editor. Oh my God, I have the best children's book. I have, can I send it to you? You know, that happens to me like, you know, probably once a week. And it's usually like people connected to like my parents. <laughs> so anyway, um, there you are. I agree with you. For, like to follow on that a little bit, I, I have a, a, an older brother who is like this amazing painter. These big, huge canvases. He puts oil paint on a canvas like you wouldn't believe from his guts, you know, just painting. He talks to me about my little drawings. <laughs> like, you know, I, I have to smile and take it. He can't see this. You have to somehow not let him see that. So, um, he, 
I mean, it, it's even a little bit of, it's not a put down exactly, but it's sort of like a, yeah, you do your little drawings. And I've got a paint on masterful painters. Yeah. Even if it, it happens. It, I mean, we, we've sort of, we've got to jump on them in the sense that a lot, a lot more people get to see our work because it's published. Right. And, um, now then usually, you know, artists, they, they'll publish a book, you know, at the end of their career or, you know, there's... Um, right. 30 years after they're dead, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and, then, um, and, and that's how we find out usually, um, well, traditionally, that's how we found out about their work. And like going back on your um, pr previous point, Christy, how um, the world is changing and because it is so visual, everything's on social media. So we get to see the lives of illustrators and, um, and you know, because we are, we're, we're a pretty giving bunch. So we're, we're constantly um, sharing stuff, aren't we? And because, um, you know, it's because it is it is a pretty cool um, world to be in. Um, whereas, you know, yeah, it's sort of, I mean, our artists have sort of had that all the time. They've had documentaries on them, just, you know, particularly if they're um, controversial and whatnot. And, um, and that, you know, they could sort of part of their own, um, their aim for fame, I guess. But, uh, yeah, it's... Um, it's good. It, it is good that it is changing. I think they're like the younger generations are saving us. They um, they can, they see that see the value in it. Uh, mm. um, audience members, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A. Um, uh, but I, um, you know, one of the things that this conversation has brought up for me is just because you know, illustration has a really specific audience in mind. Deb, I love what you said about how like, in, in you, Christy, too, talking about like, they're more likely to be employed later and the work has more impact. It's enjoyed by more people. But I also think there's a sense, uh, you know, in which illustration, like, you know, to overuse a phrase that's already overused, sparks joy and possibly a way that, you know, fine art on the walls doesn't always. Um, and, and also that it, it can do multiple things for the different audiences that are consuming it. So like, Dub, I know you were, you've talked a lot about how your illustration is really designed for children and for the adults who are reading that book to the children, um, because it is addressing that like traumatic history and really trying to challenge some of the stereotypes that are present, but also educating children about this history, even if they don't have those same stereotypes that their parents might. And so I think there's almost like, I think the impact that you can have obviously is just different and at the risk of undervaluing my own work as a museum professional, it, it does feel like there's something about a children's book that has sort of a lasting impact on um, a person's life in a way that I think an art museum experience can, but sometimes does not produce in, in their audience. Um, do any of you want to speak to that at all? Um, well, well, we'll, we'll, I, think, oh, no, I was just going to say, I think it's all in, in Henry's letter that he read. I mean, the inspiration that can come from you know, uh, a, a book that is beloved or an author who visits, an illustrator who visits, you know, I think is a personal touch that, you know, I love museums, so I, I've, I feel very inspired going to them, but I think young children, it still seems like a pretty um, daunting uh, and very adult place. Whereas a children's book, illustrator who is coming to your school or just the idea that their illustrations are pulling you in is so much more accessible and immediate to a child and I think empowers them to feel like I can do this and that's why 20 years later they send a letter to Henry with you know announce and they never forgot him and I, I love those stories I think they're so special um, because you know is sort of you know uh, modeling as it sounds, you know, you're, you're really touching lives, you know, it, the work is, is really making a difference. So I think, you know, as frustrating as it can be sometimes to feel a little bit second class um, in the children's book world, I think um, the takeaway is that, you know, the lives that you touch um, and inspire uh, 
go so far. So keep that in mind. It's amazing, isn't it? Though? You, um, there's a um, there's a connection there. The kids, you know, see that connection and they can see that, like you were saying, it's accessible. It's something that they can do. Whereas there's a separation between seeing a painting in a gallery because you, you know, you often might meet the artist. And um, whereas you know we're dependent on that, we we are dependent on on meeting our audience. And I mean, because it also helps us create, you know better better um, books for them and um, mm. in the future and 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 also you know that whole like there's a responsibility there where you know like you know Henry's Henry you change somebody's life you know you you um, um, and the, you know the fact that they and then they reminded you of it you know well, when I'm they, not, I'm not on all the people that I scarred when I was a teacher <laughs> <laughs> The straight track that won't let them write like I'm oh. thinking backwards when you know I'm thinking about the book that inspired me or the um, when I was in third grade. My wonderful teacher, Miss Patterson, Dorothy Patterson, she read a Charlotte's Web after lunch every day, a chapter of Charlotte's Web. And that book, you know, it's still my favorite book in the universe. It's like the most perfect book. If E.B. White was alive, I would write him a letter saying the same kind of thing. I'm just, I'm just so taken by that book. It was, it was perfect. The little illustrations, Garth Williams, oh my gosh, perfect book. So it worked, you know, goes back, goes forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think this is a fabulous place to end. I just did want to um, come back to one, um, to the conversation about how people are always pitching you all ideas and things as you, as soon as you say that you're a children's book author or illustrator or publisher. Um, we have actually already gotten that question um, in the Q&A. So if you, um, what would you say to any aspiring um, children's book authors or illustrators in our audience today. Can I steal your idea? I mean, uh, can I take a look at your idea? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess you, know, you like connect with other illustrators, I think. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's quite easy to do in this, in this age. And, um, you know, especially on social media, um, because then you you know there's a there's, there's a stack of knowledge out there um, that you know other, other illustrators will share mm -hmm. with you because so um, we're actually we you know we, you find that we, we're quite a tight bunch like we do um, there's a great community you know the publishing community. Um, I, th I think Christy's the one to answer that question. Yeah, I would say I absolutely think you should connect, you know, with other illustrators for sure. Join a, a you know, a group if you can. Um, there's also, uh, you know, this SCBWI, uh, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, which is a great place to go to when you're first starting out because it gives you lots of um, information on the publishing uh, landscape. And um uh, you know, if you're an illustrator and you're also dabbling in writing your own books, jo join a writer's group. Um, but definitely do your homework. I think a lot of that sort of cold call or cold sort of pitch, um, you know, it should come from an informed place, I think, when you're going to really, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to take the time, uh, you know, uh, or take an agent or an editor's time, you know, make sure that, um, you know, you've done your homework and also, you know, look at the marketplace. That's also very important. Know what's being published. I mean, you know, I mean, as editors, we get, you know, every week we probably get 20, you know, cute cat manuscripts or, you know, fun loving dog manuscripts. I mean, you know, I, so pay attention, you know, really read as much as you can. Um, and uh, again, um, read everything, read Publishers Weekly, read, you know, really, you know, if you really want to make it a career, you know, be on top of it. Do, you know, do the research like you would do it for anything else that you're interested in. It's different to fine art, isn't it? It's, you know, it's um, illustration is different to um, fine art. That's, that's you know, very important, very important point too. Yeah.
Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. This has been enjoyable. We have thanks to each of you, Henry, Dub, and Christy, uh, for joining today. Um, um, if you haven't already, definitely check out our other art and life programs. We've done them on wine labels, on tattoos, on the art of plating food, and also on comic books. So um, a big thank you to all of you panelists and to Joan Kendig again. Guys, that's awesome.